Now, from WYDC-TV, this is Big Fox News at 10. We begin tonight in Steuben County, which is trying to hire more attorneys to work in the area. However, in the past, the county has struggled to recruit and retain attorneys. Matt Kleindienst is in Corning tonight with a look at how they're trying to tackle the issue. Good evening, Scott. The Public Defender's Office and the DA's Office are one of several places that are struggling to fill positions, and the county manager tells me the problem could get worse in the future. It's not getting any better. In fact, it's getting more challenging. Attorneys are hard to come by these days in Steuben County. For years, the county has had a hard time retaining and recruiting lawyers. And with a recent lawsuit settlement with New York State, County Manager Jack Wheeler says the hiring problem is going to get worse. Through that settlement, New York State guaranteed that counties will increase the public defense capabilities within essentially by 2023. At the same time, we're going to be forced and, and are actively looking to hire more attorneys as the years go on, and that just makes it more and more difficult. Wheeler says part of the problem is that the county is competing against different regions of the country for talent. There's many uh, graduates from law school that want to move to uh, a more uh, metropolitan area or, or a larger suburban area. Uh, or move down south. We're, we're competing, you know, geographically, not just salary-wise. Wheeler says the county is trying to recruit law school students from the area and are working to keep county salaries competitive. The county is also trying an informal mentorship program. Seasoned attorneys are working with young attorneys who come into the area uh, to show them the ropes and show them what it's like to practice law uh, in Steuben County and, and in a rural area. Matt Kleindens, Big Fox, WYDC in Corning. The Gaffer District announced they'll be hosting a Rediscover Corning event during 4th of July weekend. That event would limit Market Street to pedestrian use only from Thursday, July 1st through Tuesday, July 6th. The Gaffer District says it's working with local businesses to create a fun and unique experience to celebrate Independence Day weekend. I think they're going to really enjoy this, uh, you know, collection of great things from our businesses as well as entertainment as a part of their holiday weekend celebration. The event needs to be approved by the Corning City Council before those preparations can be made. Kids 12 to 15 years old can now get vaccinated against COVID-19. It's already started in some states, and as Britt Conway reports, education leaders say it's one more weapon in the fight to get kids back to full-time, in-person learning as soon as possible. And you can relax, it's okay. And the CDC gave Pfizer the okay too on giving its vaccine to kids 12 to 15 years old, like 14 year old Graham Peisner. He has big plans. Um, hang out with some friends and go buy some Microsoft products. As for school, I'm pretty sure in the fall I'll be going back in person in school. That's exactly what Education Secretary Miguel Cardona wants to see too. There's no reason to wait any longer. But it's a work in progress. Take a look at this map from Education Week, tracking each state's mandates. As of Wednesday, 12 states are fully open in dark blue. In two states, it depends on the grade. That's in light blue. Red means partial closure. Two states, plus D.C. and Puerto Rico. But the rest of the country is in gold, which means there's no statewide order in effect. So it's up to the district or even school to decide. Every day that passes is a wasted opportunity. Now that kids 12 to 15 can get vaccinated, Cardona says it's time. Even two to three weeks being with your classmates, being with your teacher, uh, helps students be prepared. Though even he said two weeks ago, some schools face legitimate challenges in reopening, like outdated buildings with old ventilation systems, reduced capacity on buses, and community spread of COVID-19. But he says help is here. This is about getting students into school. We'll see you in three weeks. I'm Britt Conway reporting. A man was killed in Philadelphia after a gunman opened fire on a group painting a mural for another shooting victim. Alicia Roberts has the story. She like bang, 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 bang. It happened in broad daylight. And she called me and she's like, Mom, I think they're shooting again. This mother rushing home to make sure her daughter was okay. Just outside her front door and across the street from a middle school, a scary but all too familiar scene. Less than six months ago, another guy got killed right there. Nice guy. Still don't know why. There were about eight to ten people standing on the corner where there was a memorial for a male that was killed sometime last year. 
A memorial to mark a friend shot and killed last fall. They were also painting the side of a market. Now the place of another violent tragedy. The shooter walked up and from very close range began firing shots into the crowd. Police say the gunman fired 10 shots, hitting four people, killing one man. A 20-year-old male who was shot multiple times throughout his chest and torso and hip area was pronounced dead. The three others are being treated at Presbyterian Hospital. Two men are listed in stable condition. The other, hit multiple times in the chest, is in critical condition. We're getting information that someone did return fire. Police say five shots were fired back. It's not clear if either shooter was hit. The man suspected of opening fire in New York City's Times Square made his first appearance in court via video in Bradford County, Florida today on attempted murder charges. Farrakhan Muhammad was given no bond and will have to remain in jail until a hearing is held regarding his extradition to New York. Muhammad is accused of opening fire in Times Square over the weekend, injuring two women and a four-year-old girl. The August trial of three former Minneapolis police officers charged in the death of George Floyd has been postponed. A Minnesota judge delayed the case until next March, so a federal trial could proceed first. J. Alexander King, Thomas Lane, and Tu Tao are all facing charges of aiding and abetting Floyd's murder in state court. Last week, a federal grand jury indicted them on charges related to violating Floyd's constitutional rights, and those are the charges they'll face first. Former officer Derek Chauvin was also indicted on federal charges. He's already in custody, awaiting sentencing on the murder charges that a local jury convicted him of last month. Leaders in the Houston area are trying to get a posthumous pardon for George Floyd. The Harris County Commissioner's Court unanimously passed a resolution calling for one Tuesday. Floyd served time for allegedly selling $10 worth of crack cocaine there in 2004, but the only evidence was the testimony of former detective Gerald Goins. He's accused of lying to get a warrant and charged with murder and record tampering. More information is out regarding the 2020 fatal shooting of Breonna Taylor. The Louisville Metro Police Department says officers at the scene should not have returned gunfire, and a report from the department's professional standards says a use of force policy may have been violated. Hayden Ristevsky reports. Well, the, the target I'm firing at is, this, is, is a muzzle flash followed by a human, I think I said like abnormal or uh, distorted human form at the end of the hallway. That's Detective Miles Cosgrove describing the moments he fired inside Brianna Taylor's apartment. But in a newly released report, an investigator with LMPD's Professional Standards Unit suggested the officers who fired their weapons that night violated the department's use of force policy. Sergeant Andrew Meyer wrote that ultimately, the wrong person was shot and killed. His report detailed the policy that authorizes LMPD officers to use deadly force. The report says Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, posed a threat to officers since he fired his weapon first and shot Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly in the leg. But Meyer said Taylor's safety should have been considered prior to officers returning fire. There's two people almost overlapping, and they're like this at the end of the hall. The PSU report concluded Mattingly should not have taken a shot since he did not have a clean, clear shot on an isolated target. It said Cosgrove failed to identify the person who posed a threat before firing 16 times into the dark apartment. Meyer concluded his report on the use of force by saying, quote, There was an obligation by policy to only use deadly force against a person presenting an immediate threat. The officers could not safely take the shots given these circumstances. The officers did not safely take the shots and Ms. Taylor was struck and killed. Additionally, they took a total of 32 shots when the provided circumstances made it unsafe to take a single shot. This is how the wrong person was shot and killed. Ultimately, the department's interim chief at the time decided not to take disciplinary action against Mattingly, but fired Cosgrove. Still ahead tonight, after getting the green light from the CDC, Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine is now available for children as young as 12. But studies have shown children are missing vaccines for other diseases. Why top U.S. health officials are urging parents to get their kids caught up on those vaccines along with the COVID vaccine. Here's your local stock market update from Big Fox.
Now, your Twin Tiers forecast from Big Fox. Tonight's Big Fox forecast is brought to you by William Matar. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Kim Walker with your weather update. A little bit warmer today than it was yesterday, and it was definitely an enjoyable day with some sunshine as well. In Elmira, it was about three degrees warmer than yesterday afternoon, about six degrees warmer in Corning and about five degrees warmer in Watkins Glen. With dry air in place and with a mostly clear sky, temperatures will be cooling down quite rapidly. In fact, our dew points are in the 20s and 30s, and that will allow for temperatures that will be dropping down into the 30s early tomorrow morning. So 38 degrees around 4 o'clock, and then we eventually warm up to around 40 degrees at 6 o'clock. And so it is going to be a cool start to the day. You will need a jacket or a sweater early on Friday, but during the day, we are expecting those temperatures to really climb up closer to normal temperatures than what we have seen. So high pressure continues to build in from the west and that will leave us with mild conditions and it's going to be a, a quiet weather day as well. So let's take a look at your hourly planner at around eight o'clock. Readings will be around 52 degrees, jumping into the 60s by 10 o'clock and we will be in the mid to upper 60s by your noon hour and stay in the upper 60s through the afternoon, mainly sunny and it's going to be a, definitely an enjoyable day. For the end of the week, we are expecting mild conditions to continue, and it will be mainly dry as high pressure will stay right on top of us. Here's our next storm system, and that could bring a few showers across our area, a low pressure system that will move to our south. We have a slight chance for a stray shower or two Friday afternoon, and then another round of slim chances of rain on your Saturday. So I don't think it's going to be a lot of rain. Most of us will miss out on that rain, but there will be one or two of you that could get a sprinkle or two or just an isolated shower for the next couple of days. So for tonight, it will be mainly clear. Temperature is cool around 38 degrees in Corning and also in Elmira. Highs tomorrow will be around 68 degrees in Corning and 66 degrees in Perkinsville, but around 69 degrees in Watkins Glen, so it's going to be a really nice day. We are expecting close to normal temperatures through the weekend. Again, there is that isolated chance for a shower, uh, maybe just a stray shower or two, but it's not going to add up to much. We do warm up into the 70s on Sunday before dropping back down into the upper 60s on Monday with the possibility of a shower or thunderstorm. We'll be back into the 70s for the middle of the week by Wednesday. Look for partly cloudy skies with a high of 72. After getting the final green light from the CDC, Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine is now available for kids 12 and up. But over the past year, studies have shown a lag in other vaccines in children. And top U.S. health officials are urging parents to get their kids caught up on those vaccines as well. Mandy Gaither has more in today's Health Minute. A concerning trend throughout the pandemic, routine vaccines overdue for children across the country, according to some pediatricians. Both at our practice and national data showed that um, the well visits didn't drop that much in the younger ages, but at the older ages, they certainly did. So TDAP, HPV vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, things like that. Top U.S. health officials now urging parents to catch kids up on other routine shots alongside the COVID-19 vaccine, which is now authorized for those as young as 12. We call you if you don't come in, we send you letters. This is this is a basic part of primary care. It's not easy and we're all tired, but it's something that we do every day. The CDC recommends children get 14 different vaccinations protecting against different pathogens. Timing is important for many of the vaccines to create the strongest immunity. But until Wednesday, doctors had been advised to avoid giving the COVID-19 vaccine within two weeks of any other vaccine. COVID-19 and other vaccines may now be administered without regard to timing. This includes simultaneous administration of COVID-19 with other vaccines on the same day, as well as co-administration within 14 days.
The reason for the change, the CDC citing substantial safety data now collected on the COVID-19 vaccine. The agency says experience with other types of vaccines shows any adverse effects are generally similar when vaccines are given together or alone. But the agency says it doesn't know if people will be more likely to have a reaction, adding providers can take into consideration whether a patient is at risk of falling behind on vaccines. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. A black softball player in Durham, North Carolina, says she felt forced to cut her hair during a game. The high school sophomore says the umpires enforced a rule that she calls discriminatory. Now she and others are pushing for change. Laura Levine spoke with her about what happened. Hillside High School sophomore Nicole Piles loves the game of softball. This is a photo of her on the field during the April 19th game against Jordan High School. She said something to the umps, and the umps came up to my coach asking about my beads. And so I was just like, well, it's fine. Um, I'll, tuck, I'll put them away. Piles tells me it was the top of the second inning. Her team was winning when the umpire noticed her knotless braids with beads, a style she says she's worn before at games. I came back in to hit again. It was brought up that was another issue that they couldn't see my, that's when I, again, they couldn't see my number, but now it's a safety issue. She says she was told she had to remove the beads in line with the National Federation of State High School Association's policy or she couldn't finish the game. Team, all my friends were cutting out, cutting out some of my beads. They snatched some of the beads out of my hair. How did you feel? I felt like just so embarrassed and disrespected. Nicole's dad says he contacted all parties involved immediately. I was deeply hurt because my child should have never, none of those girls should have never had to endure that type of behavior. It was just four months ago that Durham became one of the first cities in the state to ban discrimination based on hairstyle in the workplace. DPS released a statement late today citing its support for the Crown Act and saying Durham Public Schools supports our students' right to free expression and imposes unreasonable or biased restrictions on black women's hairstyles. But to extend that into the classroom and to the field, so that um, young girls like Nicole and so many other uh, student athletes and just students in general can live in their full dignity. And now the Youth Justice Project is among those pushing for change. I want everybody else to know that you need to speak up when you're being bullied, discriminated, any of it, because that happens to a lot of people. People never want to talk about it because they feel like somebody's going to come after them. Whether they do or they don't, be strong in your own shoes and stand for what's right. Panic buying at the pump is already having a big impact on road trips and even threatening some air travel. And with Memorial Day weekend just a couple weeks away, it could be a big problem for the travel industry. Mandy Gaither has a closer look at the impacts. Panic at the pump, putting a freeze on what the travel industry hoped would be a hot rebound beyond road trips. Anxious drivers racing to fuel up their tanks and all that panic buying driving up the price of a gallon of gas. Part of that spike is because the pipeline is offline and part of that also is demand. So gas prices are going to be expensive this summer. According to AAA, the national average is now $3. That's the highest gas has been in nearly six years. AAA says it's hopeful the pent up demand will drive people to go on road trips this summer. People will continue to travel. They may just make a couple of changes, like they may not travel as far as they originally planned. Airlines also feeling the pinch in Atlanta, the world's second busiest airport, looking for additional fuel suppliers. Southwest says it's having fuel brought in by tanker truck and American Airlines rerouting two long haul flights for refueling, all in response to the shutdown of that massive colonial pipeline, which supplies nearly half of the diesel and gas to the East Coast, adding to the headache the trucking industry is having a hard time finding tanker truck drivers to get gas from one place to another. Our goal is to not have any stations out of gasoline. And um, unfortunately, that's probably going to happen. And that really bothers me. That's sparking concerns that even when the pipeline is back online, this shortage could cause many independent gas stations to run out of gas, especially in vacation hotspots. For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Mandy Gaither. A bit of a drop for Bitcoin after Tesla CEO Elon Musk said you can't buy his electric vehicles with the cryptocurrency anymore. That price drop came early this morning. So what's the reason behind his move? He says it's because of how Bitcoin is made, explaining 
He's concerned about the, quote, rapidly increasing use of fossil fuels for Bitcoin mining and transactions, especially coal. No comment, though, from Tesla, including how many vehicles have already been bought with Bitcoin. YouTube will shell out $100 million to creators who use YouTube Shorts, its TikTok competitor. The video platform says creators with the most engaging content will receive money from the fund. That money will be given out over the course of this year and next year. YouTube says to be eligible, all you have to do is post original content on Shorts. A similar medical condition has created a special bond between a Minnesota boy and his new golden retriever puppy. As Mariel Mose reports, seeing their relationship is one of life's little marvels. Marvel. This puppy is a boy's best friend from the day Marvel made her way to her new home in Waconia just a week ago. Marvel. Marvel. Wait, now we gonna keep her forever? Yeah. All three kids in the Williams family instantly fell in love with this puppy, but it was seven-year-old Paxson who found his perfect match. Because I have a prosthetic and she has three paws. Paxton was born extremely premature and developed an infection in his leg that stunted the growth of it. Three years ago, his parents made the decision to have doctors amputate his foot and give him a prosthetic leg so he could more easily walk and move around on his own. Meanwhile, Marvel was the only one in her litter born without a front right paw. When she was born, we knew right away she has a special purpose. Barb Feltz is the breeder of Rolling Oaks Goldens in Litchfield, where Marvel was born. Right away, she had a vision for Marvel's future. We wanted her to go in a home with someone who had a limb difference. <laughs> that home is right here in Paxson's arms. It was like they knew that they were special. Stephanie and Blaine love to see their son and Marvel overcome their limb differences together, walking on their own along trails near their home, dad capturing their matching yet miraculous strides. The amount of emotions that were running through me at the time, it was just awesome because it was knowing that she was in the perfect place at the perfect time. Stephanie has already seen Marvel make a difference in the way Paxton shares his own story with his friends and neighbors. As he's introducing Marvel to kids in the neighborhood, like it gives him the opportunity to tell, tell the kids, oh, she's missing a paw, she's like me. And like, it just gives him that voice too to advocate for himself. She loves me. We want to leave you with a smile tonight. Independence Day is still a little ways off, but what else could be more American than celebrating National Apple Pie Day? Apple Pie has come to symbolize America and American patriotism, along with baseball and hot dogs, of course. At this point, it's about as American as you can get. You can post your celebrations with the social media hashtag National Apple Pie Day. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night.